Thank you very much for your warm introduction uh, and thank you for joining us here this afternoon. Our talk is entitled Discovering Microplastics, Their Environmental Accumulation, Impacts and Solutions. There are three of us laureates for this first presentation and so we're going to split our contribution into three different parts. My section is going to be about the discovery of microplastics, their environmental distribution, their sources, and their pathways to the environment. But really, what I want to do in, in, in the next 10 minutes is to take you on a journey of some 30 years of my life that's taken me literally all around our blue planet. It started in the 1990s when I was studying to be a marine biologist doing some crazy experiments on a rocky shore, applying seawater during low tide. I haven't got time to talk about that now, but I'm happy to answer questions on it later on. What I noticed, though, during those experiments, that I visited the shore every day. Every day there was plastic arriving. Every day I cleared it away. The next day it was back again, sometimes more. I started to work with volunteer groups, cleaning the shores near to me of the plastic that had accumulated. That's the first beach clean I organised, pictured in the middle, or the results of it. A chance observation came while I was doing all of that that really changed the course of my career. I noticed that the smallest pieces of plastic that were very abundant were not being counted, they were not being removed. I asked a very simple question, and I got some of my students to help to answer. I said, what are the smallest pieces of plastic debris now contaminating our oceans? That was in the mid-1990s. Ten years of work, largely to the side of my main career as a marine biologist, resulted in this paper in 2004, the first paper using the title Microplastics. In that paper, we showed that these small fragments of plastic that we called microplastics were present in seawater and sediments all around the UK. Critically, we showed that their abundance had increased significantly over the previous 40 years. We showed that they were eaten by a wide range of creatures. It doesn't in itself show harm, but it shows a potential pathway for harm. And all of this work pointed to perhaps a global problem that could result in physical and chemical toxicity. Now, since that first paper, there have been many, many contributions to the field of microplastics, including some of those from, of the laureates here, which we will talk about in a bit more detail, but many others from scientists all around the world, including here in Japan. In fact, if I look at this current number of papers, we're up to over 4,500 publications using the term microplastic from that first paper using the term in 2004. Some of our contributions, I guess, were quite early on, some of those where the line is almost flat in the early 2000s. In 2011, we showed several years of work uh, accumulating in this paper showing that actually microplastics were not just around the UK, they were distributed globally in marine sediments all around the world. This was opportunistic sampling from trips to different parts of the world, including some here in Chile, collected actually during uh, our honeymoon. So over time we were gathering these pieces of evidence about accumulation in the environment. Each piece of tiny plastic identified down to the individual polymer that you see on the right-hand side. But it wasn't just beaches and places near to cities. As we went on, we showed that microplastic was contaminating the deepest parts of our ocean, places never before visited by humans. And actually, if we went thousands of metres up to the top of, top of the world almost, it was accumulating uh, in, in Mount Everest. In this slide here, we show that in the Arctic, we were finding substantial concentrations of microplastic in sea ice. Concentrations that surprised me because they were greater than some of the concentrations in the cities uh, much closer to populations. Here's the work summarising that deep sea exploration, thousands of metres down, and the work near the top of Everest when we showed microplastics were present, nearly 8,400 metres up. So it's truly we're showing it was a global contaminant in the natural environment. But it wasn't just the environment. We also looked at the creatures inhabiting our blue planet. And we showed that microplastics, and I say we, because here this was work led by one of my students, by, by Amy Lusher, who was a master's student at the time, now runs her own team 
working on plastics in Norway. But we showed that of 500 fish we looked at from the English Channel, a third of them were contaminated with microplastics. Ten different species we looked at. Some of them commercially important species. Again, it doesn't point, it doesn't describe harm. It shows the potential for harm. It shows the creatures were eating the plastic. We're going to turn to harm in the next uh, talk, which was supplied by Tamara Galloway. Even when the plastics are in the creatures, we went further into the distribution and showed that within a matter of hours, the plastics were taken up, the really small pieces could be taken up from the intestine, from the gut. And as you see on the right-hand side, this heat map of a, a scallop, a commercial scallop, showed that within a matter of six hours, now we're talking about really small plastics, nano-sized plastics. They could pass throughout all the tissues of that scallop within six hours. If we move the scallop to clean conditions, the plastics would progressively leave the mollusk, but some remained. And even after 28 days, we still had traces of plastic in, in the mollusk, particularly in some of the tissues, like the hepatopancreas, a bit like the liver in a human. It doesn't describe harm, but it shows the potential for harm. It shows the potential for accumulation of micro and nanoplastics in some of the vital issues of the body of these marine creatures. If I turn then from the distribution in the environment and in creatures to some of the sources, where was it coming from? We were anxious to understand that. One of the first sources we looked at was in cosmetic products, which we had understood contained some of these microscopic fragments of plastic as a kind of abrasive agent, including a range of beauty products. Again, I'm describing the work of my team. Imogen Napa, a really clever and dedicated PhD student in my lab, painstakingly counted the microbeads in these cosmetics. She showed that a single container could have three million small pieces of plastic in it. It was that evidence that went to the UK Parliament, the only scientific paper presented as evidence that led to the ban on the use of these small pieces of plastic in cosmetic products. It's a real achievement, if you like, because it's led to legislation real wide, a real achievement for a young PhD student. It's a real triumph, and yet at the same time, it's an immense frustration to me. Why? Because if you look back, I realised that the patent on the use of these small pieces of plastic in cosmetic products was filed by industry some 50 years before we sat down and counted them. And I have to ask the question, did nobody in the industry ever consider where were all these particles of plastic going? If they'd asked that question a little bit earlier and asked for help on the potential harmful effects, maybe we could have halted the escape of hundreds of thousands of tonnes of plastic to the environment from this one source alone. And that points to the future because increasingly it is essential that we work with industry to help us see off these problems rather than wait for us to find them in the environment and then bring the legislation. We need to work with industry from the start of the design. It's exactly the same story with the textiles in clothing. We showed that when you wash a load of clothing at home, a single washing machine load, it can release 700,000 fibers but interestingly, the rate of release of fibres was very different between different but similar looking garments. Up to an 80% difference between two similar uh, functioning and appearing garments, which again tells us very strongly that there are things we can do at the design stage to drastically reduce the rate of fibre release to the environment. Those fibres in the first study were going via wastewater. They were going to wastewater plants. Some were escaping to the environment. But in a further study with Francesca De Falco, who's also part of my team, we showed that while washing of clothes was an important source, actually half of all the emissions to the environment don't come while you're washing the clothes, they come while you're wearing them. And this again points back to design of better clothing as being the place for the solution, not filters on washing machine or wastewater treatment plants. So understanding the sources and the pathway is really critical if we're to move to solutions that Penny will talk about later. Similar story with something we've been investigating more recently, the escape of tyre wear particles. Each time you drive a car on the road, you apply the brakes, the tyre starts to wear out. It wears out, we know it does, because you need to replace the tyres. Each time you apply the brake or turn around the corner, thousands of small bits of tyre wear, you see them illustrated in the middle, are escaping to the environment. 
These are potentially highly toxic. They're not intended to be anywhere near human consumption, uh, and we're really concerned about their accumulation in the environment. We've shown that there are substantial pathways when it rains, and those particles are washed from the, ro from the road in, in stormwater. Also, some of that will pass to wastewater treatment and will escape from there. But very substantial quantities are going into the atmosphere and then settling onto the Earth's surface, including the surface of rivers and estuaries. And together with Penny, we're working at the moment on a big project to understand where they travel and what ha how much harm they might present. If I turn to major pathways, we've also demonstrated that rivers were major conduits ca carrying plastic and microplastic, potentially from cities thousands of kilometers inland, right the way to the ocean. In, before I conclude, I, I want to actually really acknowledge some of the early work that inspired some of our thinking on toxicology, work by um, my good friend, Professor Shigi Takada, who's here in the audience with me. Here in, in Japan, in Tokyo, he'd shown back in 2001 um, an important aspect of plastics, how they could attract hydrophobic contaminants from the environment. And these, constant, these contaminants would become super concentrated on the surface of the plastic within days. And that was one of the things that prompted our study on the right-hand side, where we looked at, well, okay, what happens for those chemicals that have accumulated on the plastic? Are they released to a creature when the creature eats it? In the different chemistry, in the guts of a creature, would they be readily released? And indeed, we showed that they were. But it was inspired by Shigi's work here in Tokyo. So, in answer to this kind of question, if you like, how did I go from training to be a marine biologist to being now described as the godfather of microplastics? It was a term that was given to me when myself, Penny, and Tamara all presented evidence in the UK Parliament on microplastics. The MP talking to us, Mary Cree, turned to me and she said, Professor Thompson, I understand you are described as the godfather of microplastics. And so over this time, I've made the switch from a marine biologist to somebody that still works now exclusively, really, on plastics and microplastics. If I could have one wish, and I look back at the time that's elapsed while I've been working on microplastics, and here we see a plot, not just of microplastics, but of all the plastic waste generated since the 1950s. You see it progressively increasing year by year. When I was born in the 1960s, we're still almost horizontal, hardly any waste yet produced. Still at that time, my second Christmas, I'm now surrounded by plastic toys. A testament, if you like, to the benefits of plastic when they're used in durable applications you can still see a very well-functioning uh, sailor man here from the 1960s, and I think some of his limbs and joints are better than those of my own. It demonstrates if we use plastic in a responsible way in durable applications, it can bring benefits. If we use it in single-use applications, then it creates the waste. If I could have stopped that when we first made this observation in the 1990s, all of the curve to the right would have been prevented going to the marine environment. If I could have stopped it in 2004, by this time it had already doubled since I first started working on it. The waste in the environment had already doubled, but still, most of it is yet to come. Today, 2023, Blue Planet Prize, what lies to the right of that solid black line is the predictions for the amount of plastic waste that we will generate up to 2050 if we don't change our ways and a substantial amount of that plastic is going to enter our blue planet. The quantity that's going to enter the, the blue planet between now and 2050 is greater than the quantity that has entered so far, which is why it makes it absolutely critical for us to take action. If I look to the future, then, we have the UN Plastic Treaty, which nations are now working towards. 180 or more nations now signed up to the UN Plastic Treaty. I see this as a once in a, in a planet opportunity to solve the problem, but we can only do it by working together, by working together across nations for our blue planet, by working together across society, industry, policy, and science, so that we don't recreate that problem of the microbeads being introduced as a patent in 1950, but the harm not being discovered for many decades. We can only solve the problem for our blue planet by working together. 
Thank you very much. It's our blue planet. Its future is, in my view, very much in our hands. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, as uh, Tanuma has already said, unfortunately, Professor Tamara Galloway was unable to come, and so I have offered to give her talk for her, and I hope I can give it some justice. So Tamara is a professor of ecotoxicology at the University of Exeter, and her group addresses three main questions. Firstly, how does pollution damage living things? What makes species more or less vulnerable? And how can we use this knowledge to protect the environment and human health? As Richard said, just because microplastics are present everywhere in the environment, it doesn't mean that they are causing harm. For most contaminants to do so requires them to come into contact with the living things around them. In the case of microplastics, the reason they are such a cause for concern is that they overlap with the prey items of many, many different marine animals that rely on particulate matter and planktonic species for food. To address the question of whether this was happening required us to study a wide range of species depending on the nature of the question being addressed, right across the food web from the ocean surface to the sea floor. Our initial studies were conducted using fluorescently labelled plastics in the laboratory because this enables us to use microscopy to locate the plastics after they've been ingested. In these images, we studied the uptake of microplastics by planktonic species that include some of the most numerous on the planet. On the left, we have a marine copepod, and on the right, this is a tiny three-day-old larval oyster. In each case, the animals readily ingested our test plastic, and we could locate them right down to the tiniest particles in the animal bodies. But the next important concept to study was what happened to the microplastics. Did they pass straight through the body, in which case there would be limited opportunity for them to cause harm? Our experiments, this time done with mussels, filter feeding animals important both as a food source and for maintaining the clarity of coastal waters. We found that microplastics of a whole different range of sizes could actually pass through the lining of the gut. From here, they could be taken up by blood cells and therefore circulate in the animal's body. The microplastics, in fact, could still be measured in the animal bodies for over 48 days. And at this point, the experiment was finished. They could have well been there for much longer. This important finding confirmed that microplastics were available to cause damage to the animals ingesting them and could be transferred to any other animals that ate them. We pioneered the use of another technique, more commonly reserved for human health studies, hyperspectral imaging, in which infrared lasers are used to vibrate molecular bonds, allowing them to be visualized. Here, this technique was used to locate the microplastics embedded within the lining of the gut of a crab. And this was without the need to label the plastics or to dissect the animal. In this slide here, the same technique has been used to locate microplastics stuck onto the outside membrane of the gills of crabs, attracted by their hydrophobic nature. We also studied whether this might be happening further up the uh, food chain, and a shared PhD student of myself and Tamara's, Emily Duncan, found microplastics in the gut content of 102 stranded turtles, including individuals from all seven species of turtle from three oceanic basins, the Atlantic, Mediterranean, Pacific. The presence of microplastics with no ingestion of larger plastics suggests the possibility of multiple ingestion pathways. They may have got there from drinking polluted seawater, from the sediments, from trophic transfer, from contaminated prey or foraged items such as seaweed. So what types of harm might we, like to see, might we see with microplastics? 
Here, sedimentary marine worms have been used as the model species to allow us to study the effects of culturing the animals in sediment that is contaminated with particulates of PVC for up to a month. The physical effects of the exposure were that the worms were less able to ingest energy due to the ingestion of the non-nutritious particles. So the worms ate less, the food passed through the gut more slowly, and there were inflammatory changes visible in the worm's blood cells. Microplastics are complex contaminants, combining both the solid plastic particles themselves with many different chemical additives added to make them harder or softer or as UV protectors or antimicrobials. In these experiments, we measured the release of a plasticizer called phthalate from plastic particles into the worms. Phthalates are classified as endocrine disrupting chemicals, able to adversely affect hormone and immune systems. Finally, a third concept of harm is illustrated here through the transfer of absorbed chemicals. In this case, another form of microplastic fibre is released from cigarette butts. Toxic nicotine and cotinine have led to inhibition of burrowing behaviour in the worms. This function is crucial not only for their health, but also for the health of the marine sediments, keeping them well oxygenated. So it could be that contamination of the marine environment, as we've just seen, is again an issue only for environmentalists. It doesn't actually affect the average person in the street. But you would be mistaken. In this study of Tamaris, they looked at plastic polymers present in a range of high-value seafood where we used analytical chemistry techniques of pyrolysis gas chromatography. Enough plastic was present to contaminate the average eater of a plate of sardines to around 30 milligrams of plastic at every meal. If you try to add some numbers to that, well-modelled estimates are that the average person consumes around a credit card of plastic a week from multiple sources. In fact, it's between 0.1 and 5 grams a week, with the 5 grams being the upper limit. But this isn't just from seafood, but also from plastic packaging, from plastic lids, even the air we breathe, which, particularly indoors, can be filled with plastic fibres, from artificial carpets, or, as Rich has already said, from textiles. It can come from the fragmentation of laster items and many other common daily activities. It's not really ethical to try and make one's students ingest an environmental contaminant to study their effects. So another approach that Tamara used was to try and remove that plastic from their diet. So she enrolled 120 students into a trial of unpacked and unprocessed foods to test how this affected the plastic they intake. Regrettably, it actually improved impossible for them to find enough food to eat that had not been packaged or processed in some way, truly illustrating that ubiquitous nature of the contaminants that we've been studying and the urgent need for solutions. So I'm going to move on now to my own part of the talk. And to start at the beginning, my background is in molecular marine biology, with a particular focus on zooplankton. As such, ever since Richard found all those tiny particles, I've been really interested to determine if the prevalence of these small plastic pollutants in the marine environment cause a problem to the small but vitally important marine zooplankton. Zooplankton are common to marine ecosystems across the globe. One of the group of zooplankton that has been my focus are copepods. They are amongst the most abundant animals on our planet and provide a key link between primary producers, the plants, and higher trophic levels such as fish. They also help to regulate the Earth's climate through their role in global carbon cycle. Our initial studies on zooplankton were basic laboratory exposures, performed by an excellent PhD student, Matt Cole, who was with myself and Tamara. These were performed when we actually had very little knowledge of what was there in the environment, what the microplastics were and how many there were. 
And the studies that Matt Cole undertook showed that every species of zooplankton that we have looked at have the capacity to ingest microplastics. So 15 years down the line, and our experiments have become more sophisticated and more environmentally relevant. We now have a much better understanding of the bioavailability and impact of microplastics to zooplankton and other marine animals. In summary, we know zooplankton have the capacity to ingest microplastics, and when they do so, they eat less food, so they exhibit reduced feeding capacity, a decline in the energy they have, and therefore a lower reproductive output. This has direct relevance, not just to the individual, but to the animal population and the community. We also now understand that the chemical profile of microplastics ingested impact on the health and may act as endocrine disruptors and impact an important life stage such as molting. So microplastics that are ingested by the zooplankton, as you saw in the video earlier, are also egested in their faecal pellets, which has been shown to alter the properties and sinking rates of those pellets. And copepod faecal pellets are a source of food for marine organisms and contribute to the vertical flux of particulate organic matter as part of the biological pump. Therefore, a lower sinking rate increases the opportunity of the pellet to be eaten by other organisms, resulting in trophic transfer and reducing the organic matter reaching the sea floor. We've also now shown that microplastics uh, have, can be consumed in their natural habitat, in the natural environment, and there is evidence that they may actually select what type of plastic they eat. However, the factors affecting the bioavailability of microplastics to zooplankton are complex. Another student, Sarah Bottrell, did a number of laboratory-based studies and confirmed that the shape of the microplastics influenced their uptake, but that this actually varies with the different zooplankton. In addition, she demonstrated that infochemicals which are absorbed to the outside of the plastic, such as dimethyl sulfide, actually increase their uptake. So only with combined laboratory-based studies that we can control and in-situ assessments can we better assess the current risk posed to the marine environment and tailor mitigation strategies to have the greatest impact. So while our work on microplastic and zooplankton continues, it has expanded into many different areas, from those small beasts at the base of the food web up to turtles and whales. We work with colleagues across all science areas, including chemistry, how those infochemicals make plastic tasty. We work with mathematical modelers, determining where the plastic goes in the marine environment and where the hotspots are. We work with remote sensors, detecting plastic litter from space, even the microplastics. And we work with social economists, calculating the social cost of plastic litter. As we've been leading the way in this field, we've had to be innovative in designing novel techniques. For example, we've designed the Sediment Microplastic Isolation Unit. This was a student, Rachel Kopok, and this is quite a simple unit which just allowed us to remove microplastics from a range of sediment types. Another student, Sarah Nelms, developed a non-invasive methodology pipeline so that we could investigate the dietary exposure of seals to microplastics. Our expertise also involves nature-based solutions, and it is on these solutions that the rest of the talk will focus. So over many years, we have built up information on where microplastics come from, where they go, how many there are, their bioavailability, and the impact of them. More recently, we are using this knowledge to help develop solutions. One such solution to remove microplastics is a novel approach inspired by nature. While large plastic can be cleared from waters and beaches, microplastics are very small, so we can't use mechanical mechanisms. And during our research, we have found that mussels are relatively tolerant to marine pollutants. They're voracious filter feeders, natural biofilters that can improve water quality, removing excess nitrates and phosphates, bacteria and particulates. So for this project, instead of focusing on plastic toxicity, 
we wanted to scope whether there may be a role for mussels to act as a nature-based solution, helping to remove microplastics from polluted waters. We know from field sampling of mussels and static experiments in the laboratory that mussels can filter out microplastics, but we wanted to know if they can do this efficiently in flowing water, such as you would find in estuaries. So we tested this in a custom-built built flume tank, where five kilograms of mussels were added to the tank, which had filtered natural seawater and a mixed algal diet. We then added nylon fibres and polystyrene beads as representative microplastics. Following replicate exposures, we demonstrated the rapid removal of both polystyrene beads, which you can see in this graph here, and also the nylon fibres. You can see that these microplastics decrease quite sharply after the first three hours, after which the removal rates do tail off this is likely as the mussels were saturated with food, as you can see on the right-hand graph. So the results show that five kilograms of mussels can actually remove a quarter of a million microplastics from flowing water in just one hour. We found this was encouraging news for our nature-based solution idea. The next phase was to use information from this lab work and flume work to develop and deploy a system whereby the mussels could go out into the natural environment where there would be lower microplastic concentrations. We used a cage system whereby the mussels can't escape, they're protected from predation, but a flow of water is allowed to pass over the mussels. From these results, five kilograms of mussels resulted in about four and a half times more microplastics captured than in the controls where there was no mussels. This is certainly gives us hope that there is scope to expand testing this nature-based solution to multiple sites with a greater amount of mussels, perhaps in a stacked system. So such a nature-based solution could help clean up and stem the flow of microplastics to the open sea. It should be prioritised as close to source as possible, where there is a threat to coastal ecosystems, organisms and human health. However, prevention should certainly be the first priority. Another solution at source is to work towards a circular economy. The linear economy of take, make, waste means that a large volume of plastic is discarded after use. Not only is this causing an environmental problem, but it is also a huge loss of valuable resources. We need strategies to prevent leakage into the environment, reduce production and consumption, and support reuse, repair and repurposing, as well as recycling. We hope to inspire innovation to consider the whole of a plastic item's life, from design stage to end of life, with the intention of prolonging the lifetime of products. We need to drive towards a circular economy that maintains plastics at their highest value for the longest time. Another possible solution to the problems of plastic waste is looking at bioplastics that are biodegradable. These are made from a renewable carbon source, such as a plant material. And as a consequence of their molecular structure and resulting properties, they're regarded to have enhanced rates of biodegradation compared to conventional plastics. They're already used in applications with substantial pathways to the natural environment, such as agricultural mulch. Yet our understanding about their fate in the natural environment is poorly understood. We're currently improving our scientific understanding about the fate and impact of biodegradable bio-based plastics. We hope the outcomes of our research will help provide the potential risks and benefits to help guide development for the next generation of innovative plastics. Working towards solutions for plastic pollution, we've been raising awareness and giving evidence. We're passionate about disseminating our work, and our pioneering work has reached a global audience, featuring in numerous programmes, including Eating Our Way to Extinction, Plastic Warriors, and Blue Planet 2. By raising awareness with the general public, we help to connect people's everyday choices with the impact plastic waste is having on our oceans. Collectively, as Richard said, we have presented evidence to a range of bodies from the House of Lords to UN hearings on microplastics, and this has led to a change in policy. 
legislative changes are very welcome and a clear sign to the general public that indicates behaviour change. But to date, it has been very minimal and far more needs to be addressed. More recently, we are contributing towards the International Negotiating Committee as the high profile initiative of the Global Plastics Treaty. There is need for this global cooperation and collaboration into the foreground, and this has the potential to influence positive change at all levels of society. We hope that the treaty will be based on independent transdisciplinary evidence and include discussion across sectors, including scientists, industries, governments, and local communities. We hope that the world leaders will initiate appropriate solutions for a global scale change. We are the generation shaping the future of our Earth. Our choices and actions determine our impact on the environment. And as Richard said at the start of the talk, this is our blue planet. Its future and our future is in our hands. Thank you very much. Richard.